Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dee Perry and I'm senior host and producer of Applause and Sound of Applause for 90.3 WCPN and WVIZ PBS Idea Stream. I'm so pleased to moderate today's forum, a conversation with Evan Wolfson, president and founder of Freedom to Marry, the national campaign for marriage equality. Mr. Wolfson is also author of Why Marriage Matters, America, Equality, and Gay People's Right to Marry. The conversation around marriage equality has been going on for the past 40 years. The U.S. Supreme Court first dismissed a marriage equality case in 1972. That case was brought by a same-sex couple denied a marriage license. Since that time, a growing group of advocates, including Mr. Wolfson, have pushed for marriage equality in America's highest courts and in the court of public opinion. Evan Wolfson is a civil rights attorney and has a long history of defending the freedom to marry. Citing his national leadership on marriage equality and his appearance before the U.S. Supreme Court in the case Boy Scouts of America versus James Dale, the National Law Journal in 2000 named Mr. Wolfson as one of the top 100 most influential lawyers in America. He's considered by many as the architect of the national marriage equality movement. He launched Freedom to Marry in 2003, one year before Massachusetts became the first state to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples. In the last 12 years, 36 states plus the District of Columbia have passed laws allowing gay and lesbian couples to wed legally. Said another way, nearly 72% of Americans now live in a state currently issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples. Many of those victories have occurred in the last two years, which is the last time the Supreme Court heard arguments on the marriage rights of same-sex couples, until yesterday's announcement. Yesterday, SCOTUS blog reported that the U.S. Supreme Court will hear oral arguments on April 28th on consolidated marriage equality cases out of Kentucky, Michigan, Ohio, and Tennessee. The decision, which isn't inspected until June, could establish a 50-state solution to the question of whether same-sex couples have the constitutional right to marry. And how fortunate that Mr. Wolfson is here with us today. So let us get to it, ladies and gentlemen. Members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Evan Wolfson, President of Freedom to Marry. Thank you. Evan, one thing I didn't mention in that introduction is that there are hundreds of thousands of individuals, including the heads of almost 400 major U.S. corporations, who are filing friend of the court briefs to support a ruling in favor of marriage equality. So I want to start with what brought us from the 1972 climate to where we are today. So that's a great question. The country has been on quite a long journey. It seems to many people that we won this overnight or that it happened immediately or people think, wow, this just came out of nowhere. But it, it didn't come out of nowhere and it wasn't overnight. As you absolutely rightly said, gay people have been challenging our exclusion from marriage since the dawn of what we think of as the modern gay rights movement beginning with 1969 and the Stonewall Revolt. Within three years, as you said, cases were making their way and were actually ruled on in the Supreme Court. But what happened in that first wave of marriage cases brought by couples seeking the freedom to marry is that they were all rubber stamped away. The country just wasn't ready. The country hadn't heard the case for who gay people are and why marriage matters. A second wave of marriage litigation began in the very late 80s, early 90s. And the most important case of that was the Hawaii case. And that Hawaii case launched this ongoing global movement that has led to, as you just said, 37 states, 72% uh, of the American people having the freedom to marry, 20 countries on five continents, all up from zero a little more than a decade ago. So you can ask, why did this first wave of litigation fail and the second wave of litigation launch the movement that we're in today that has brought all this progress and that we hope will deliver the national victory as soon as June? And the biggest answer to what happened, to explain that difference, is what happened in between those two waves. What happened in between those waves was AIDS. AIDS shattered the silence about who gay people are. It prompted non-gay people 
to see gay people for the first time not as stereotypes and prejudices, but as real people, as people grieving, as people fighting for their loved ones, as people caring, as people committed, as people discriminated against. And it began to move hearts and minds. Okay. And AIDS also prompted gay people to understand just how vulnerable we were through our exclusion from marriage and the protections. And it transformed our movement from a movement fighting to be let alone, don't harass us, don't arrest us, don't persecute us, to a movement fighting to be let in, let us share in the opportunities, the dignity, the respect. And gay people came to understand that we needed to talk about who we are. We needed to reach out to non-gay people. We needed to talk about common values. And those millions of conversations amidst all the battles of this second wave of the struggle is what has led us to that point. It's the opportunity we've given people to think it through and to open their hearts and change their mind. You, though, have been thinking about and uh, writing about marriage equality since at least 1983. It, it was um, the basis for your, your Harvard Law thesis. And I wondered what you wrote about it, how you imagined it, and what the response was in 1983. Well, I got a B. <laughs> so I've been trying to make up with extracurricular activities ever since. But I made two, two big arguments in that, in that paper, which is on our website and looks like some ar ar archaic document from the, you know, the, the medieval ages. It's typed because it's all we could do then and so on. Uh, and I, the two arguments I made were that, first of all, that Marriage is the central social and legal institution of this and virtually every other society that's ever existed. And you can't say you're for equality if you acquiesce in exclusion from this central institution that brings so much tangible and intangible meaning, as well as tangible and intangible protections and responsibilities, that marriage is something important and gay people should have it. And the second argument I made in the paper was that the work of winning the freedom to marry, that by engaging in the fight to win the freedom to marry, we would be claiming this vocabulary of love and commitment and connection and self-sacrifice and connectedness and inclusion that would transform non-gay people's understanding of who gay people are to enable us to win marriage, but also more generally to enable us to advance and become part of the whole. And so that fighting for the freedom to marry is important because marriage is important, but it's also important because it is this common vocabulary, this way of changing everything for gay people. And that is what this 40 years of battling and fighting, but also quiet persuasion and, and beautiful stories like we heard in the Standing on Ceremony play, people getting to connect with gay people, not as stereotypes, but as real human beings, struggling, dreaming, loving, committing. And, and it sounds as if in, in the writing of that paper um, and, and before, you had already seen a path for yourself as, as an advocate um, through the legal system, or, or did that unfold more organically than it Well, you know, I was in law school. It was my third year paper, so at that point I imagined I would be working in the legal system and working to change things, and I, I was never particularly motivated about money, one of the big mistakes I've now made in my life. Um, <laughs> and instead really had a, 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 a commitment to wanting to make the world a better place. That is something I really wanted and saw law as a tool to do. Uh, and I did begin volunteering at Lambda Legal, which is uh, one of the country's preeminent legal rights groups for gay people, right out of law school once I, once I got settled in my job and began writing briefs in my free time on legal pads at night while I was doing my day job and so on. So I, I always wanted to be engaged, I wanted to help change things, and so on. And I always also understood that fighting for the freedom to marry and fighting for gay rights generally and fighting for social change and civil rights is not something that is easy and it doesn't happen immediately and it doesn't happen without stumbles and it doesn't happen overnight. And so I would be preaching to people, including when I was here at the City Club 11 years ago, that this was something we could win, but it was going to take time. But you know, when you're younger, your idea of long is shorter. <laughs> and so I'm not sure I, in, when I was writing that paper or beginning this path, necessarily saw myself sitting here 31 years later, 32 years later, 
still pushing. But on the other hand, I feel very lucky because we all know civil rights movements don't always just take decades. Sometimes they take centuries, mm -hmm. and the work is never done. And we are the lucky ones who, if we keep doing this work, we're going to live to see it. Uh, on that, that path, um, I wanted to go back to something that, that you mentioned, um, a Hawaii case uh, that was a landmark case in, in 1993. But in terms of long journeys, it, it only um, came back to fruition in 2013. Talk about um, what the issue was in 1993 and what the path was. Yeah. So gay people, as I, as I mentioned and as we discussed, uh, have, have sought the freedom to marry, have fought for the freedom to marry since the entirety of the gay rights movement. It's not a new thing. It didn't come out of nowhere. The Hawaii case was not the first important case. It was the second wave. But it was the most important case and in the second wave, and it was that second wave that, as we discussed, launched the movement that we're seeing this momentum and progress in today. When the Hawaii Supreme Court in May of 1993 ruled that the government could not just rubber stamp the denial, that if the government wants to deny gay people the freedom to marry, it at least has to show a reason. That was the first time we'd even gotten that day in court. It was the first time we'd even gotten a court to take seriously the question. And the Hawaii Supreme Court sent the case back down to the trial court to allow for what became the world's first ever trial, where my non-gay co-counsel, Dan Foley of Hawaii, and I, a young attorney back in the hair days, uh, <laughs> actually had the chance to be in court and call our witnesses and put on the evidence and to cross-examine the state's witnesses and at the end of the day to show that there is no good reason for denying gay people the freedom to marry. And so what was so important about the Hawaii case was that it was the first time we really had that chance to pose the question to a court and to the country, what reason is there for denying loving and committed couples this important bundle of protections and responsibilities and dignity and meaning? And it turns out there is no good reason, and it turns out though we didn't win in Hawaii immediately because it was politically attacked and squashed, the conversation, the question, resonated throughout the country. And as the American people wrestled with that question, we've now gone from 27% support for the freedom to marry back when I, we, when I was doing that Hawaii world's first ever trial to now, according to CNN a couple weeks ago, 63% of the American people who favor the freedom to marry because they've had a chance to think it through because we gave them the chance to ask that question and think it through. And that's why it's so important to continue that engagement. My mantra through all this period has been there's no marriage without engagement. We have to engage people. And that work, by the way, is not done. Even though we have tremendous momentum, even though we're heading toward the Supreme Court and we're filing these briefs from all these different businesses, from clergy, from mayors, from child welfare experts, from Republicans, even though we're making this chorus and case to the court and the country, until we get the job done, we are not done. And, and a case in point is that after that um, initial win and then loss in Hawaii, people pointed to the overturning of that ruling as leading to the Defense of Marriage Act in, in 1996. Talk a bit about what that act was, was saying and, and what's become of it at this point. Right. Well, as we had that first day in court and the eyes of the country focused on this courtroom in Hawaii, the American people began wrestling with this question for real, as I described. Similarly, the opponents of gay people's equality realized that we were about to have the opportunity to undo this discrimination that they loved and that the power of asking the question and engaging and the power of the American judicial system, the independent courts, would enable us to call the government into that courtroom and force it to defend discrimination. And when they had to defend it, they couldn't. So the anti-gay side began pouring millions of dollars into Hawaii to amend the Constitution, to block the courts from finishing the job, which is where the Hawaii case ended. And meanwhile, in Congress, literally, Literally, at the time that I was in this courtroom fighting for gay people's freedom to marry, not a single gay person had ever gotten married in the world. But literally at that point, our opponents were in Congress pushing a radical law, the so-called Defense of Marriage Act, that said that 
even if gay people do ever get married, because there were no marriages at that point, the government will discriminate against those marriages. The federal government, for federal purposes, will withhold from those marriages any respect for the, for the marriages that we had yet to even celebrate. And it took us another 17 years of engagement, of battling, of fighting, but we did reach the Supreme Court on that question. I had said at the time, this will not stand. It is unconstitutional. The federal government cannot be creating a gay exception to how it will treat marriage and how it will treat lawfully married couples. And sure enough, through all this engagement, through all the political momentum, through the, ba the battles, we learned how to win, unlike that attack in Hawaii, the battles on the ground, the persuasion, the energy, the conversations, the learning how to pass legislation, the learning how to persuade Republicans as well as Democrats, the learning how to win ballot measure fights, which we didn't have the wherewithal to do in Hawaii, but we learned how to do, too late for Ohio, but soon enough in 2012 for Minnesota and other states. As we engage this whole battle, we set the stage for the Supreme Court in 2013, when this question reached the court, to strike down that gay exception and set the stage for what we now hope will be the successful return to the Supreme Court to finish the job nationwide. I, I want to back up um, to some more of your personal history for uh -oh. a bit. <laughs> no, it's, it's all benign. Um, <laughs> But you, for a while, taught political philosophy at Harvard and also worked on um, a sexual harassment task force for the state of New York. And, and I wondered what those experiences helped you to bring to the, the, the struggle that you're still engaged in now. Well, teaching political philosophy, was, I was a teaching fellow. I wasn't some grand professor. I was a teaching assistant. But it, but it was wonderful. It was a great chance to re-engage with the, the texts I had studied in college and now be teaching them uh, to college students while I myself was a law student. So it gave me an excuse to not do my law homework and instead <laughs> think about things I really was interested in and, and to engage with students. And uh, I think the experience of teaching, even more than necessarily wrestling with any particular philosophical tract, uh, was an important part of the work I think we all have to do, which is to engage with other people, hear their concerns, see what they don't know, see how to best make the case, and to make it over and over and over and over in order to help bring people along. So that was a, an important experience for me and a very fulfilling one. And uh, I was appointed to this, when I was a young attorney uh, working as a prosecutor by day and as a gay rights attorney by night, I uh, was appointed by Governor Cuomo, then the Governor Cuomo, the senior, to the Sexual Harassment Task Force th uh, of New York State. That was in the wake of the Clarence Thomas hearings and the Anita Hill um, revelations and so on. And so uh, it was also, it was another opportunity to provide, to be part of public service, to not limit myself squarely to gay rights, but to be able to talk about how the principles of, of American justice and the need for inclusion are as important for women as they are for gay people, overlapping sets of people. And it's not just one or the other, it's about something core that we all share in common. And so it was a great experience for me uh, to be able to do that as well. Yeah. And along the way, I'm sure you've heard um, many arguments and, and cases against marriage equality, against gay rights even, I, I'm wondering how you teach to change strongly held beliefs. Well, one answer is the one in my, in my book, Why Marriage Matters, where I take a set of questions, the familiar questions that well-meaning but not always favorable disposed people are legitimately asking. And sort of the meta lesson of the book is don't dismiss those questions. Engage people. Let's, let's not write people off. Let's give them a chance to wrestle. And by the way, you may have to do it 100 times. You know, it's not you have to give people what they need to get to the right place. But if you give them enough information and time, that's the recipe for change. And that's, that is exactly what's happened with the American people going from 27% to 63%. And I also felt that the you know questions are legitimate. The question questions like how will this affect my marriage? 
How will this affect children? How will this affect society? Uh, is, this, uh, is the freedom to marry a question of civil rights? Is the freedom to marry something that can be resolved by giving you something other and lesser? Is there a quote unquote compromise to be had? These are, these are real questions that people had and I felt that the, we have the right answers, let's give it to them and let's engage them. And so that's, that's what I've, that in, in grand terms, that's been the work of our movement and that's been the work of Freedom to Marry, the campaign that I've been part of to drive the winning strategy of this larger movement which has to do the engaging and the conversations and bring the pieces to bear of political change and all of that though rests on this engine of conversation and persuasion and engagement and helping people get from where they were to where they now are. You know, we just filed, as I mentioned, a multitude of briefs these last two days in the U.S. Supreme Court. Hundreds of leading businesses in America uh, supporting the freedom to marry. Hundreds of Republicans and conservatives. Thousands of faith leaders. Hundreds of mayors. Well, they weren't all there 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 5 years ago. But they got there because we all gave them what they needed and challenged them to think about their core values of fairness and the golden rule of treating others as you'd want to be treated. We showed them the evidence of real stories of real people, people in love, people doing the work of marriage who deserve the commitment of marriage. And we encourage people to wrestle and, and move. That's how we've, how we've moved it. That's how we've moved the people because we've moved the people we have also now been moving the courts. And because we've now been moving the courts and the people, we hope that soon, if we keep doing this in the next several weeks we have to make the case, we can also move the Supreme Court. You know, we've won now in the last two years more than 60 state and federal rulings in favor of the freedom to marry with only a very small handful, literally three or four, uh, against the freedom to marry in the last two years. That's not where the courts were. 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And in all these 60 plus rulings, my favorite line, and it's a line we actually quote, Freedom to Marry quotes in the, in the friend of the court brief we're filing today in the Supreme Court, was a line from the Utah case where we won the Freedom to Marry in, yes, Utah. <laughs> and what the judge in Utah said, and I can almost quote it exactly, was it isn't the Constitution that has changed. It's our knowledge of what it means to be lesbian or gay. In that passage is exactly this theory of social change, the strategy that freedom to marry has led. We always have the right arguments. We always have the grand promises of the Constitution, the freedom to marry, which is a constitutional right, equal protection of the laws, which is a constitutional right. But you have to get people to want to apply it. You have to get courts to see it. And the way you do that is by this connection. And that's the work we've done in winning the freedom to marry. Mm. Still though, as, as we're talking about the freedom to marry, about marriage equality, and I, I've seen blurbs next to it that say, the next big civil rights fight. That phrase, civil rights, creates some tensions within um, the community, uh, I mean, within a lot of different communities that say, how do you compare civil rights for um, gay marriage to civil rights for people um, voting, for people just living? Right. Well, I don't like the phrase, the next big civil rights or the civil rights fight of our generation, yeah. because we have several civil rights fights still underway in our generation, the right to vote women's right to choose, everybody's opportunity to participate fully and equally in society. That's what civil rights are. Civil rights don't belong to just one group or one person or one battle or one moment. They are part of what we all deserve as the American promise and as our dream of fully participating in society. So I don't like pitting one against the other or staging them or suggesting these are old and now this one's new and so on. So on. But when President Obama in his State of the Union address a few weeks ago talked about the freedom to marry as part of America's, and he used the phrase, civil rights arc, when he talked about in his State of the Union, I'm sorry, yeah, in his, in his inaugural address, when he talked in his inaugural address about the national civil rights arc from Seneca Falls to Selma 
to stonewall. What President Obama was expressing then is what I do believe, which is that civil rights is something we all believe in and all aspire to and are all entitled to and all have to work for. And none of us has full civil rights until we all have full civil rights. So in that sense, <laughs> in that sense, a very important sense, the freedom to marry is of course part of America's civil rights arc, its civil rights journey, and the obligation we all have to do the work. Absolutely. It, we've talked about um, your creation of freedom to marry, or, or at least what freedom to marry is about, but I'm, I'm curious about the history just before you left um, to create that. You were working with Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund, um, a gay rights advocacy nonprofit, and you were doing some of the work with them that you're doing now. Why did you feel the need to go out on your own? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, I, I'm still extremely close with Lambda Legal and the ACLU and the National Center for Lesbian Rights and Gay and Lesbian Advocates and Defenders, the, the four major legal arms of this movement who are the indispensable comrades in arms and soldiers and fighters and leaders, and they're also my close friends. So when I left Lambda Legal, it wasn't for any negative reason, but what it, what it was was we had just come to an end of, of this period of the 90s in which we had won the world's first ever trial in Hawaii on the freedom to marry, only to see it snatched away politically. We had launched the next freedom, big freedom to marry case in Vermont in order to have a second front in this national debate while fighting against the attack in Congress with the so-called Defense of Marriage Act. And we had won by 2000, not marriage, but civil union. A huge step forward and yet short of the full freedom to marry that we were fighting for. And so, as we came to that, the end of that chapter, and it was literally the day I argued in the Supreme Court. It was April 26, 2000. And I argued in the morning in the Supreme Court, and then after a day of meeting with people and talking and feeling this huge weight lift off my shoulders, I got back on the bus to schlep back up to New York, and my cell phone rang. And I was told on the cell phone that then Governor Dean of Vermont had just signed into law that same day the civil union bill. And so on this very same day, these two huge pieces of my work, the marriage work culminating in civil union at that point, and this Boy Scout case that I'd been doing for 10 years culminating in my first and last uh, argument in the Supreme Court, it was a little bit of a signal to me that I should think about what's next. And as I thought about what's next and wrestled with it, what I realized was the movement had this legal arm. We had these terrific legal organizations. We knew how to win in court. We won in court in Hawaii. But our political organizing, our public education, our use of what Dr. King called the method, all the methodologies of social change was not where it needed to be. And so I left Lambda in order to leave the lawyering in the great hands that were there. And I'm happy to kibitz every once in a while. But what wasn't there was the political organizing, public education, direct action, mobilization, ultimately electoral work. And to get that where it needed to be, so that we didn't keep winning things only to see them snatched away, I created Freedom to Marry to drive the multi-methodology, multi-state, multi-partner, multi-year campaign that these legal groups and new political groups and groups like Equality Ohio and campaigns like Why Marriage Matters Ohio and others could come into so that all of the pieces were being done together to get where we needed to go. Litigation is an extremely important tool and the strategy has always been, the freedom to marry strategy has always been the way we're going to win ultimately is by winning a case, bringing the freedom to marry to the entire country in the Supreme Court. But history tells us that you don't just say, I want to go to the Supreme Court, go to the Supreme Court and be done. If it were that simple, we would have been done 40 years ago when the first marriage case reached the court in 1972. Or we would have been done when the, when the next wave of important marriage litigation finally reached the Supreme Court in 2013. We struck down the so-called Defense of Marriage Act, but we didn't win the freedom to marry nationally because we hadn't done everything needed. What's needed is to build a critical mass of states and a critical mass of support and go to the court and say America is ready. Now do the right thing in the Constitution. 
I believe that's where we are now. And that's why we're all feeling this momentum and this excitement and this hope that we're going to win. And the reason I left Lambda, the litigation arm, to create the overall multi-methodology campaign was to make sure that all of that happened as hopefully it now has. Evan Wolfson, um, it's fascinating talking with you. Um, and I could go on, but, but I'd like to open up the conversation for our audience here. So uh, um, we will do a little business in between and uh, come back and do that. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dee. I'm Dan Malthrop with the City Club, and today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're enjoying a Friday forum featuring Evan Wolfson, founder and president of Freedom to Marry, kibitzing with Dee Perry, WCPN host and producer. We encourage you to prepare your questions for Mr. Wolfson now and ask that your questions be brief and to the point. We welcome all of you here and those joining us via our primary media partner, 90.3 WCPN, WVIZ PBS 104.9 WCLV IdeaStream, or one of the many other radio stations across the region and country that carry City Club programs. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Our community partners for today's program are Cleveland Public Theater and Equality Ohio. We thank you very much for your support. We also welcome guests at tables hosted by the ACLU of Ohio, Cleveland Public Theater, Equality Ohio, and Why Marriage Matters Ohio. We thank all of you for your support. Be sure to join us next Wednesday, March 11th, as we welcome Aaron David Miller, Vice President for New Initiatives and a Distinguished Scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars for a conversation on the presidency, power, and the Middle East. For more information about that program or any of our upcoming or past forums, please visit us online at cityclub.org. Now, it's your turn to ask questions. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding our microphones today, our content associate, Teddy Eisenberg, and our volunteer, Spencer Kiesel. Our first question. Uh, Mr. Wilson, sure. Mr. Wilson, thanks for being here and for your terrific work. Uh, these days, there's been renewed conversation about the religious exemption argument, and uh, there seems to be some momentum in that camp uh, for progress on the other side uh, through that work. Can you comment on whether you think that has potential to uh, delay the work that uh, you've been working for? Every civil rights advance in American history in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, whether it be strides toward racial inclusion and justice, strides for women's empowerment and equality, strides for immigrants, and you go right down the list, every one has been accompanied by an effort by those who oppose the civil rights advance to try to undermine it and carve out exemptions from it through often the invocation of religious liberty. Now religious liberty is an important American value. It's something we all believe in. But our country has wrestled with this question of the right way to allow religious liberty to be a shield for what it should protect without being a sword to further discrimination. And so for example in the 1964 Civil Rights Act we struck the right balance. Those who said that if they don't like black people or they think interracial unions is somehow against their religion, that they should not have to comply with the Civil Rights Act, we rejected that argument. And instead what we said is for proper religious authorities and the proper exercise of their religious functions, of course there should be protection. No one should be able to tell a church, for example, who it must marry. But to just say, I have a religious view and therefore I don't want to comply with the law no matter what I'm doing or no matter where I am would mean that people would be deprived of the very opportunity to participate fully and equally in society that a civil rights act or a civil rights step or the protection of a constitutional right is aimed at achieving. So we've gotten this balance right in the past and we've also seen attempts to undermine and, o and overturn that balance time and time again. We are yet again in another period where there's an effort to carve away and, uh, and undermine this very important protection that has strengthened America's constitutional opportunities for everyone to believe what they want to believe in religion, but also participate, participate fully and equally in society. And so what we need to do is organize and fight back and shore up our lawmakers to do the right thing 
and to repudiate this renewed effort, this cyclical effort, to undermine the civil rights advances our society is making. Because it, to carve out special licenses to discriminate for anyone who doesn't want to abide by the law destroys the law. It destroys the civil space. It destroys the democratic marketplace and sharing that is essential to everybody, every American's ability to participate and be in society together. And if you don't want to take my word for it, one of the strongest voices who's come out against the, this latest effort to carve out religious exemptions from, from basic legal protections is a man named Michael Bowers. Now, I don't know if that name rings a bell to people. Michael Bowers is a Republican. He was the Attorney General of the State of Georgia for something like 16 or 17 years. And most famously, or infamously, he defended the anti-gay position in the biggest single defeat the gay rights movement ever had, our five to four loss in the Supreme Court in 1986 in the Bowers v. Hardwick, Bowers v. Hardwick case. He, in the past couple weeks, has come out strongly against these efforts to carve out special so-called religious exemptions. And he makes two arguments. Number one, he says, the only reason anybody's asking for these things is to discriminate. Let's be clear, he said. This is Michael Bowers, not Evan Wolfson, saying that. <laughs> and secondly, he said, if we start giving permission slips, if we start giving licenses to discriminate in defiance of laws of general applicability, we destroy the rule of law. If Michael Bowers, the Republican Attorney General, the defender of the anti-gay position in this historic, infamous Supreme Court case, can see with clarity the right path for America to remain on with regard to civil rights and inclusion, we all can surely make that case and beat back these attempts in the legislatures where they're being tried. Again, thank you. You mentioned that Ohio lost a battle, and we now have a constitutional amendment that uh, establishes discrimination. Largely, in, it was an effort in uh, reaction to freedom to marry in Massachusetts. We lost that political and public opinion battle. What, other than that repeating 100 times, what kind of public education can be effective in changing hearts and minds. Yeah. Well, first of all, let's be clear. The, the anti-gay constitutional amendment that was stampeded through here in Ohio was not, quote unquote, just in response to the advance of the freedom to marry in Massachusetts at that, that time. It was part of an orchestrated political attack that saw waves of these attack measures pushed through in multiple states that year and other years. And it's those amendments those attack discrimination amendments that are being struck down in court after court after court after court, including, as I mentioned, Utah and some of these other places. It was struck down here in Ohio by the federal courts, but the appellate court, the Sixth Circuit, was the, is the only circuit to uphold one of these anti-gay amendments, and that's the case that's now in front of the Supreme Court. That's the legal path toward overturning this discrimination in Ohio. But meanwhile, rightly, those of us who are not the lawyers on those cases that are now in front of the Supreme Court and those of us who are not the plaintiffs in those cases have not been just sitting back watching to see what the courts are going to do. We've been out there talking to our neighbors in Ohio, explaining who we are, telling our stories of love and family and commitment and our dreams of caring for another person and finding someone who will put up with us in life and giving the best to our kids. And as you here in Ohio have had those conversations neighbor to neighbor, as we across the country have had those conversations, the people of Ohio, like the people of America, have moved. When the amendment passed in 2004 here in Ohio, it passed by a substantial number. Today, however, a majority of Ohioans, 52%, according to the latest poll, oppose this discrimination support the freedom to marry. So the people of Ohio, like the country, like the courts, have moved. And what we need to be doing here in Ohio, just as we together are doing in Alabama, in Utah, and in California and New York, is continue making that case. 
just as those 379 businesses spoke out yesterday and made their case to the Supreme Court, so here in Ohio, we need to be continuing this conversation neighbor to neighbor to give people the room to grow and open their hearts and move. And that combination of legal work and political organizing and personal engagement is how we achieve civil rights progress in America. Again, thank you. Uh, first time at the City Club, so I'm very excited to ask your question, too. Um, I'm curious, you talked about you know, the, what's next, uh, as you had that question earlier when you left Lambda. Um, you know, everyone here, and this is not to diminish the work of the marriage equality movement, but I'm just curious how quickly we as an LGBT community and allies can pivot to the next issue uh, regarding housing discrimination, employment discrimination, trans equality, and the list goes on. Um, you know, considering that some people thought marriage equality wasn't the fight to go after. There were other smaller battles that could have been won to build up to it. But um, yeah, I'm just curious, uh, how do we, you know, in June or July when the decision's announced, what's next and how do we get there? Right, well, first <coughs> of all, we're not done yet. So let's get this done, not just sit back and count our chickens before they've hatched. Secondly, here's where you're right. You're absolutely right that important as winning the freedom to marry and the entire bundle of legal and economic and tangible and intangible protections that come with marriage is, as much as that touches every area of life from birth to death with taxes in between, as much as that provides the largest possible single set of protections and security, particularly for the most vulnerable, people without means, people who are ill, people who are struggling, people who are, in some cases, immigrants and so on. Marriage brings a safety net that no other one single win will bring. So as important as that is, you are right that it's certainly not the only thing we care about and it's not the only thing we should have. We should have everything. We should have it all. We should have the full opportunity to participate. Whoever the we is in that sentence should have everything. And you're right that the work of our movement is not done even when we secure this full giant step forward. But where you're wrong is in the use of the word pivot. It would be a deeply poor activist step for our movement to be thinking in terms of pivoting as if, wow, we won something enormous and huge that 10 minutes ago most people thought was impossible and now too many people are treating as inevitable and we got it so now we turn to talk about something completely different because that would be throwing away this very resonant and powerful engine of transformation, this vocabulary of connection that has moved this country and moved non-gay people's understanding on the range of things you talk about rightly more than any other single thing. What we do need to do is harness the marriage conversation, sustain the marriage conversation and all the power it brings to helping people open their hearts we need to harness that to the additive work of also effectively making the case for ending discrimination on the basis of gender identity or expression, providing full support for youth, providing full support for seniors, providing protection against, non -discrimin uh, protection against discrimination in employment and housing. All these things are enormously important. Life is not full without them all. And yet to just treat them as a checklist that we race through is failing to understand the very human opportunities we have to keep bringing people along with us and keep building toward that more perfect union and toward everything we deserve. So let's fight for everything. It's not next, it's now. Let's fight, let's keep working. Let's harness what we've won and the ground we've gained and the allies we've brought in and the new understanding we've marshaled to the continuing work of fulfilling everything we deserve. And Mr. Wilson, thank you. Um, this will be somewhat of a follow-up to that question, actually, but I was wondering, in, in many of the states, there is non-discrimination where you can be legally married, so you can get married, come to work, and then get fired for sort of coming out that way, if you will. And I just wondered if there's a path similar to the marriage path through the courts to deal with that by, the courts have said marriage is a fundamental right, so how can you legally be f uh, you know, fired for exercising a fundamental right? Well, the, the 
the little mantra that some organizations have begun floating out of married on Sunday, float, uh, fired on Monday, I actually think is a bad way to put it. I think it's a trivializing way to make this case to the American people and to do the political organizing and actual work we need to do to continue getting the protections and respect and support that we want in law and that we want in life. So I would throw away that little gimmicky way of talking about it. What I would do instead is help people understand that in the absence of federal non-discrimination protection, it is legal to fire lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender people in many parts of the country. Now, even without federal legislation, we do have protection in many cities and many states. So it's not literally true that even if your state doesn't have X, you don't have any protection. Or even if the federal government doesn't have it, we don't have any protection. But it is true that until we have full federal legislation protecting every American everywhere, as well as state laws doing the right work. And, and by the way, the laws don't only prohibit discrimination. They also offer guidance to employers and to landlords and to those who run businesses so that they can do the right thing without getting in trouble under the law. They help move people in the right direction without having to go to court. So getting that full structure of legal protection through political organizing, public education, and where possible litigation is very much the civil rights work, the, the non-discrimination organizing work that we all have to do as Americans and that we have to do in this movement because the legal structure of protection is so incomplete. And we have to help people understand how incomplete it is and how, how harmful it is to somebody to fear being turned away from a business because of who they are or to lose a job because of whom they love or who they are or what their family looks like. We have to go in there and make that case, not with gimmicky little slogans, but with actual explanation and a real connection of empathy and understanding. And, and just to drive that point, there's pieces of that that we can do through litigation. There are things we can win through litigation. And again, our legal groups are doing terrific work, terrific work in examining the degree to which the prohibition on sex discrimination that's already part of civil rights law with regard to, for example, employment federally, the way in which that properly interpreted applies also to gender identity and applies appropriately to sexual orientation. There are legal cases and strategies and successes that are mounting, but it won't be complete until we have achieved the legislation, the law, at the federal level and as, in as many states and cities as possible. And that's the work of our movement harnessed to the, the growth in understanding and empathy that the Freedom to Marry has delivered. Good afternoon, Evan. Hi, Leslie. Um, my name is Leslie Huff, and I'm a lawyer practicing in Cleveland. Um, you mentioned the Bowers case and Mr. Bowers and his evolution um, of understanding, or perhaps, of um, the, the freedom to marry. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about Mrs. Loving and her evolution. I think that was one of the more stellar moments in our, in our quest for marriage equality, and I'm just so proud that, that Freedom to Marry has been a part of it. Thank you. Yes, so of course Mrs. Loving gave her name to the best name case ever, Loving versus Virginia, in which the court, the Supreme Court in 1967, struck down race discrimination in marriage. And the court, when it did so, did so on a landscape that had 34 states. We had won 34 states. So the court was in essence bringing the remaining 16 across the threshold. And at the time, 70% of the American people opposed the freedom to marry, but the court had the courage to do the right thing under the Constitution. Our strategy has always been, the freedom to marry campaign has been, to build that critical mass of states and critical mass of support so that again, the Supreme Court will affirm the freedom to marry. And we now stand before the Supreme Court having won not 34 states, but 37 states and not just having won 30% of the hearts and minds of the American people, but according to CNN, 63%, which, 
which is why we can really say to the court, America is ready. It's time for you to act. Mrs. Loving is a perfect example of somebody who didn't choose the fight, but once the fight came to her, fought to defend her family, fought to defend her love, fought to defend her marriage, and against most people's expectations, won. The Supreme Court had gotten it wrong before it got it right in Loving. And Mrs. Loving, who didn't see herself as an activist, pulled back and went back to her, her, her private life. She unfortunately lost her husband and raised kids, raised grandchildren, and built her life in her small community. But when we approached her as the 40th anniversary of Loving versus Virginia drew near and asked her with this renewed chapter in this struggle on, on this battleground of marriage, would she add her voice? She did, and she spoke out. And it's an absolutely beautiful statement. It's quoted in several of those opinions. She talks about what loving the case and loving the heart are all about, which is the freedom to marry for all. And with that journey that Mrs. Loving, like so many Americans, took, and with her willingness to overcome her reluctance and her shyness and speak out as an example of what we all need to do, get up and speak out, it shows us how we hope we can win. Hi, on uh, July 2nd, which is my birthday, I'm planning to marry my partner of 25 years, and I'm hoping to do that in Ohio. Uh, <laughs> assuming <laughs> ass assuming the, the court rules favorably, do you think there would be any you know, delays, or would it be you know, av you know, available everywhere right away? Congratulations on 25 years together. That's exactly the commitment in life that deserves the same commitment in law that we call marriage. And it's why you should have the freedom to marry. And it's why you should have the freedom to marry right here in your home. You shouldn't have to go to one of the 37 states where you now have that freedom. And you should be able to have that freedom right here in Ohio, and everyone should. If we do win in the Supreme Court in June, which of course we're hoping for and working hard and we're not done and everyone needs to keep doing the work, if we do win, most likely it would be in June, and it most likely would be in the last week of June, though it's the Supreme Court. It can do whatever it wants, but that would be the, the best guess. There then typically is implementation that needs to happen. In most places, I expect that implementation and fidelity to the law will go smoothly and efficiently and quickly. I would hope, and I would even say I would expect, that Ohio will be one of the places that will follow the law and do the right thing. But you here in Ohio need to be connected with your champions at Equality Ohio and the ACLU and Lambda Legal and Why Marriage Matters Ohio. And can you all raise your hand, you leaders here, so that they know to come in? You all need to work with these groups so that they're engaging with the elected officials and the probate judges who issue the licenses and all the structure here in Ohio to make sure it is ready for Ohio to follow the law and not impose unfair delay and harm on couples like you. And if you do that work together with our organizations, and if we all do our work in the country, we can certainly hope that we'll meet your deadline. But some of it will be a little bit in the control of others who are not me. Right. And <laughs> And so some of it uh, nobody can guarantee, but it is a very reasonable hope, and you should do everything you can, and we should do everything we can to make sure that the hopes and dreams of people like you across the country are fulfilled without even an extra unnecessary delay, because every day of delay is a day of injury and indignity and injustice. And it's time for the freedom to marry in Ohio, and it's time for the freedom to marry nationwide. Parallel with the revolution in the freedom to marry, which you've witnessed over the last 40 to 45 years, there's been a revolution in fertility services. And I uh, ask for your comment on the relevance of this, because uh, through adoption uh, and through uh, sperm donation and in vitro fertilization 
it has become possible for same-sex couples to join heterosexual couples in having children. How important has it been for the breadth of understanding in the country of the validity of having same-sex marriages for there to be this enhanced opportunity uh, for there to be children in the picture too so a same-sex family looks like a not same-sex family? Yeah. Well, in addition to all those wonderful ways of bringing children into your life and giving and wanting to give your children the best, you, you left one out, which is that many gay people also are raising kids from a prior relationship that one or one may have had. And however the kids came into any of our lives, we should all want the best for all our kids. These are all our kids. These are America's kids and they're real kids. And it does no kid any good to, to punish that kid for having quote unquote the wrong parents or the wrong kind of family by withholding the freedom to marry. And the American people have come to understand that. The courts have come to understand that. And it's actually become a very powerful argument backed up by unrefuted mountains of evidence and testimony from the nation's leading experts, the, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Child Welfare Association, the National Association of Social Workers, the American Medical, every leading authority on parenting and child welfare has affirmed that gay people are fit and loving parents, that our children are growing up just as happy, just as healthy, and just as well adjusted, if not more so, than the children being raised in non-gay households and that the denial of the freedom to marry harms kids for no good reason, and the affirming of the freedom to marry would strengthen those kids' lives and strengthen their families. And that has become a very important argument. There are friend of the court briefs making that argument to the Supreme Court literally being filed as you and I speak. The parties in the case, the attorneys in Ohio and elsewhere, are, are certainly pointing that out. And when that mountain of evidence, now even larger, came before the Supreme Court in 2013, Justice Kennedy famously singled that argument out and pointed to it as one of his reasons for why he voted with us in striking down marriage discrimination at the federal level. So it's a very important part of the legal case, and even more, I think it's an important part of our case to America about the common values, one of which really ought to be we all stand up for the well-being of every child. Evan Wolfson, um, really important conversation, and I know one that will continue as we watch what happens down the road. Thank you so much for being here Thank today. You, Thank you. And today at the City Club, we've been enjoying a Friday forum featuring Evan Wolfson, founder and president of Freedom to Marry. I'm Dee Perry from WCPN, senior host and producer, and on behalf of the City Club and the City of Cleveland, I thank Mr. Wolfson, and this forum is now adjourned. <laughs>